we've talked about the um, uh, spiritual powers and, and, and the fact that this is something that becomes more automatic. And I came across um, uh, an exploration of the way memory works and it split down into procedural memory and process memory. And they occupy different or use different parts of the physical brain. And a classic example of a procedural memory is, um, in this article was given by, you know, you know how to drive to a particular place. So you, you know the route. And the process memory is how you drive. And then we can all recall probably when we first started to drive, we were using our procedural memory of trying to remember everything that needed to happen. And it was just complex and complicated. But eventually it goes into process memory. It becomes instinctual. Uh, and then it becomes very difficult to explain to somebody else actually how to drive or tie your shoelaces or whatever it is. It's yeah. become process. Yeah. And it seemed to me that the, the, the five uh, spiritual faculties, um, uh, when they become powers, maybe they become part of the process memory uh, in the much as they are automatic responses, but not automatic pilots, but automatic responses, because you can be aware when you're tying your shoelaces. Um, and whilst, and before that, they're procedural memory. You're making the effort to remember to do it and how to do it correctly. Yeah. Well, I thought it might be a useful, uh, uh, another way of tying in uh, the development over practice uh, or the way the six R's become automatic, um, but not automa autopilot. They become automatic. They move, perhaps, they move into the process memory um, and not part of the procedural memory. And the way that this seems to work is it, it uses completely different aspects of the physical brain. Uh, they, they, they're not the same part. Um, and, uh, and that seemed like a, a, an, an interesting um, way of possibly explaining um, the way these things become uh, automatic. So procedural. That is, that's, that is a step forward. That is pretty cool. That is actually, I like that. The, the, um, the, um, I never could really get, where is it? Let me see. Um, a clear bead. I never can remember them. Um, on spiritual powers. There it is. Okay. Yeah, I know. You know, because it takes this sentence, the four bases of spiritual power, because, okay, and you're developing uh, you have you develop the basis for spiritual power consisting in constant, this is the sentence, if you write it down, you'll see what my problem is. What's okay, the so, uh, the reference page 637, and it's in sutra number 77. Uh, it's in the third part. It's section 17, section 17. Um, this, uh, you can say the student, okay, the student develops the basis for spiritual power. Okay. Consisting in concentration and then you have do to put a blank line a blank line and determined striving period okay so now you have this this sentence okay and it says i developed the basis for spiritual power consisting in concentration the first one is due to zeal, and we say enthusiasm, due to enthusiasm in your practice. The second time you say it, you say due to energy, okay? And then below that, the third time you say it is due to purity of mind, okay? Um, yeah, and determined striving. And the last time you say, due to investigation. Mm 
So it is actually talking, spiritual powers are actually talking about the condition of your practice in reference to the level of your enthusiasm and in reference to how the level of your energy is operating in the practice and your determined striving. Determined striving is uh, just when it uses the word striving, your automatic six R's is what we're talking about, the automatic six R's. And then when you say due to purity of mind, due to how well you can keep your precepts that you are keeping, whether it's eight or it's 10 or it's 300 as a monk, 300 and something. Okay. And the last one is due to investigation, meaning you are always, your, your uh, concentration is due to in investigation. And you see when it says concentration due to investigation or uh, purity of mind and stuff like that. It's also kind of a statement to me. This is not, this was not absorption, what he's talking about. That's the way I felt about this when I kept reading this over and over, this paragraph. And I would torture myself to try to remember. Now, you don't, 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 um, this is setting the stage when you think about spiritual powers. Some people think about the spiritual development of the itties. Okay, meaning, meaning uh, the itties are basically um, walking through the, you know, control of the elements where you're able to walk through a wall or dive into the earth and come up in front of May and give right. her instruction in Australia and dive in the earth and come back up in my chair right here. We don't need Zoom anymore. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> you know, but I don't want to do that anymore because, you know, I used to come down every January 1st and celebrate New Year's by coming into the kitchen on the mountain and telling everyone, okay, they're all waiting for me to come. I'd come down and come in the kitchen and they'd say, okay, and I'd say, okay, I'm ready. And Bonte would say, to what? I'm ready for me to walk through the wall. See? And the problem with that was very simple. Me is Atta and still exists completely and, 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 and all through me is still here. And of course, then, of course, the wall, actually, the wall is a concept also, which has atoms in it. It's hard. It's solid. And so when I walked forward, close my eyes and walk forward, I keep, <laughs> I keep hitting my nose and it was, it was kind of funny. I did it for three years. I, three times I tried, three or four times. I think it's, it's ridiculous. And I began to understand over the years, I, I don't know if I could ever get to a state where I totally was gone. And where when we're speaking, of course, you, you were just speaking in a, uh, a conventional reality, but to, to move in the ultimate reality and just don't say another word because you can't speak anymore. <laughs> because every single word of the English language is a concept. That's a game that we used to play. What is a concept? You know the game? You know how you say, what is a concept? Um, an automobile is a concept. So where is the automobile? Yeah? So <laughs> is it the wheels or the windshield? Or is it the gear shift or the seats inside? Where is the automobile? See? But the automobile is a concept. You can do it with a table. Is it the legs? Is it the surface? What is it? You can do it with a shoe. So then I walked around in the forest for a while taking walks, and I kept trying to find a word in the English language that was not a concept. And even the word A indicates a single something. So that's the, that's the definition of a article, A. The has a is coming. Something is coming. <laughs> it goes on and on. I couldn't find anything. And then I realized every language on the face of the earth is faced with conceptual words. And you're going to Nibbana. This is technically why none of us can write to you and explain what Nibbana is. If it's a, con 
a place uh, it's if it's a state of no concept how can we explain to you what it is we can't but we can talk to you about what it isn't then when you get there you're supposed to come back and tell me what it is <laughs> that's the way that works but anyway, this thing about the spiritual powers is frustrating because I think the this basis of spiritual power are, are a preamble to the possibility of being able to activate the itties. So the itties were walking through a wall or walking the command of the elements, you know, down into the earth and coming back up someplace else. And then it was um, flying, the lifting off the ground and enough of you, you've let go enough that you can float up, but then you can move. You can actually take command of the air. And then uh, another was reading the mind. And, um, and, and my favorite one of all times was the one becomes many. Yeah, so that was the story of the monk that came down the mountain to the meeting with the, with the, the Buddha. Uh, the monks all came down to have a meeting and listen to him give a Dhamma talk. And he said, where is so-and-so? And the one monk said, he's still, he's still there. He was cleaning and he's still there at the, at the, at the uh, monastery. And he said, we'll go up and get him. And he went up to get him. And when he, when he opened the door, there were like 40 monks and they, they uh, disappeared and the one monk was standing there. He said, what do you need? And he says, I need you to come. He got scared and he came down. He told the Buddha what happened. The Buddha said, go back up. But what you do is when you open the door quietly and clap your hands like that, they'll all go like that. And you say, tell him he's late and he needs to come down right now. So he went up. He was practicing his itties. And of course, when he multiplied, he was thrilled because he could wash the steps and sweep the kitchen and clean up the pots and do everything all at once. And he was absolutely enamored with the fact there were 40 of him running around the monastery cleaning up, this goes the story. So I dream, I dreamt of that when I first got involved because I thought what a great thing that would have been if I'd been still married with five children. <laughs> Can you imagine if people could just double everything like that? Yeah. So what do you think about this spiritual power business? When you uh, look well, at uh, um, my, my, it, it seemed to me that uh, it, it shows that the, the development of mind. And um, I was interested in, what that development of mind represented, why there was a why there was a difference, and with this this idea of the pr pr uh, procedural and process memory, uh, this seemed to be a mechanism that was that another way of describing it is uh, explicit and implicit memory. Um, so it becomes a uh, almost like a, a well, it's interesting because if you're tying a shoelace, it's just like a subconscious activity. Um, but I'm not once, sure. Once you learn it, once you learn it, sure. Once, yeah. once you learn it. Once, once you've learned it. But I'm, yeah. not, I'm, uh, but I'm, I'm not sure that the six R's, the automated six R's, is a subconscious activity. I think there's a, um, uh, I think there's an implicit intention in the practice for for that to. Oh happen. no, no, and you know, for a long time you've. You have talked in that direction. I've, I've caught it and never get to talk to you about it. The whole point of the six R's is they are not individual steps. They were a dance. And the only way yeah. I can get across to someone is if I'm teaching you the waltz or the salsa, if you want to do the salsa. They both have six steps. Now, when you're first doing it in the dance uh you know, the dance class, we're teaching you one, two, three, four, five, six, one, two, three, four, five, six, and you're plodding around. And then they turn on the Vienna waltz, the Viennese waltz, and we go around and more and more it becomes a fluid thing. 
of feeling the rhythm of this run through your body. That's what you're missing, you see? It's not supposed to be any steps anymore, anywhere. It's like, okay, if I teach you, I don't know if you play the piano, but if you play the piano and you're learning a concerto, you have to learn these sections that you're going to do one piece at a time. May can explain it to you, you know, and, and you learn the, the fingering for this one. And look at all this fingering. We have to do this fingering. I like, ah, oh, you see, you know, and she has to want you, they want you to do that. My gosh, you think about this guy in Rachmaninoff, Concerto Number 2 in C minor, go listen to it. And you have no idea where his fingers are going like this all over the place. You know, and do, 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 da, 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 you see? But if you try to do it without the fingering, you're going to never be able to play that concerto and ever be able to play it to the speed it is supposed to be done. You must, you must do what you're exactly saying. You're saying, how do you drive the car? How do you do it? And then you've memorized it. You play the concerto. So the procedural memory just goes and he sits down and plays the concerto at the concert. But you don't hear any steps anymore or any mm -hmm. sectioning off of that concerto whatsoever. Yeah. Just the way you listen to a symphony movement by movement, you see? You have to look at the six R's if you really want this to turn into right striving, and that's what you want to have happen. Right striving, there are no pieces. You see? Uh, yes. I, 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 when I was talking about uh, having intention, it's not, um, not to break it down into, into the individual steps, but, uh, you know, to... Uh, for me, there's, a, there's an intention in the mind to, um, uh, to release away from the hindrances. Um, so it's not a, um, a... That doesn't mean actually in the meditation. This is something that's set up as, if you like, um, uh, um, how to describe it. It, it. It's not an intention that starts when the hindrance arrives. It's, it's, it's an intention in the mind. It's a sort of learned intention. I know. Yeah. See, the, the, the problem is yeah, like um, you take five people that you're teaching and put them in front of you or talk to them separately and ask them, what does the word intention mean? And that's where it gets dicey. <laughs> you know, oh, uh, get, some people are going to think it really does mean steps. And some people are going to mean uh, an intention is just stating, I will sit no higher than the first jhana. That's yeah, all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah? but it's not an intention to make that happen. An intention is just a statement to the brain. I will yes. sit no higher than infinite space like that. Yes. And yeah. we don't do anything more than say that. And at once, uh, I, I think last week, I think it was, didn't I spend a, a, lot, a good piece of the time talking to you guys about the fact that what Siddhartha figured out that was different from the other teachers was he was actually setting up a communication system between himself and his brain. Cooperation, cooperative communication between the intention and what the brain decides to help you do. Uh, now, whether we can actually get into scientific terminology to explain it, I don't know if we need to. Um, I think, but we can we can do that direction if you want to try it. <clears throat> but uh, when we set up an intention, we simply say it to the brain, and then we hope it does it. Just the way when I took you from where the feelings went up to your head. And I told you we were going to do the other people. It was a test of intention. Mm. Where, what intention would do? Would you work harder on it? And some people do that. They make the mistake and they take two or three sittings. It drives us crazy. It's supposed to be one sitting, no more than one hour for those other uh, 15 people. 15 people, you know? It's 12, 13, 14, 15. So it's four of each of the other three kinds and three more of the regular one. We're asking you to do that. So one sitting. Some people, they know exactly what we mean. They tell the brain, okay, this is what we're going to do. They close their eyes. They go through the people. And 30 minutes later, they come and say, I finished. Here you go. What do I do next? So that's what I mean by... Um, 
the, and you can really you that's where the teaching gets dicey that's mm -hmm. where it gets tough and different because that's where people are in such a variable state you and not seeing you guys these people who are trying to do these online retreats not being able to see them oh boy you you don't see them when they're saying they're writing you notes and the the notes have um I can't do it that way. I have to get more involved. I had to go back to fewer questions and more involvement with what you're saying. And you know, when if you took a retreat with me, you know, I write you an awful lot, don't I, May? <laughs> you know, when I write you an awful lot, when you write me something, I tear it apart, don't I? I underline where you made the mistake. And underneath, I say, do you see what I underlined up above? Do you understand what you did wrong? Here's what you did. Here was the instruction to do it the right way. All this time, I'm like a mommy. For nine days, you get a free mommy. <laughs> you know, but it's hard work to do that. And so they tried instead to make it 12 questions, you see, but still there was an issue of slow progress instead of faster progress. Why? I'm not sure, but I think Zoom has a lot to do with it if we can't see you. Because we get a lot from you by seeing you in the interviews. Yeah, it's very difficult. But they, they were, you know, where Bonte's running 50% of, of going all the way through the, the line, 50% out of so many people. And I'm running pretty high with the ones I'm working with, okay, on a steady basis. Uh, and then we hear somebody has a 10%. We wonder why. And then if we start... We don't have a chance to really talk to them when they're to find out how are they presenting? You know, how are, are they changing work without really looking at the balance? Like I was talking to you earlier about the balances and stuff. Yeah. So pause. it's tricky. It's very tricky. And, and why, why can I keep it working pretty strongly? And I think uh, David's, done so much that he's able to keep it going pretty strongly. But when we other people branch out from us, it's difficult. So why? And I think um, both David and I had had numerous retreats of sitting there quietly and watching Bonte interview. This is the key the biggest key piece. Not being allowed to speak. Only one person wanted to speak all the time when he was in training for that. But most of the time, not speaking and just watching him with the student and him. That's it. And just writing down what just happened. What was the problem they came up with? And what was his solution? What was the problem? What was the solution? Mm, then we learned, learned something. We started learning some very intricate things. <laughs> My very intricate stuff about how we didn't have to work so hard in order to figure out what to tell the person to do because something else was happening. This should be another lesson. I'll tell you what it was later. Because actually, um, there, was, there was more there than we thought was there until you see it 150 times, 200 times in front of you. You won't catch it. You won't. Maybe you will, you're sharper than I am. <laughs> but it took me a long time. And one time when we were in Korea, I sat there after the person left the room. I said, wow, that's what you're doing? Oh my gosh. So there are some little things that are going on, but you have to have what I'm talking to you about tonight is that foundation stuff in your blood. You have to have it in your mind, through and through, remembered. It's not a lot of information, is it? Five aggregates, right? Six cent stores, the Chinese six, there you go, six. <laughs> you know that, man, you know? One, two, three, four, five, six. That's the way they used to do it. Seven, eight, nine, ten. Anyway, um, it's five aggregates. It's six cent stores. It's three kinds of feeling. It's how does a feeling happen? 
and then you see the first peak at dependent origination, but you don't know it because we show you what happens from a sense door to um, contact, to feeling, to craving. That's that part. The other part are the five precepts and the five hindrances. And at the very front of the line, it was the four, four noble truths, the five precepts, and then the five hindrances, and then those pieces I just mentioned to you, the six sense bases, three kinds of feeling, how does contact and feeling happen? You see? You have to have that. You play with the hindrances from there. You play with everything comes from there. And you're doing those pieces when you're teaching um, the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta in the front part of the Dwaita Vitaka Sutta about what was the Buddha doing? He was trying to show, he figured out very clearly the difference between living over here on the unwholesome side or over here on the wholesome side of everything everything and from that sutta you get an idea you get the image that maybe the five precepts the importance of them came up really like this very clearly to act as an umbrella for these hindrances that were happening you get that feeling from that sutta see and he tells you in the end of that sutta Whatever you think and ponder on, that becomes the inclination of your mind, the direction of it. And the direction of your mind goes into thoughts, and thoughts flow into actions, and actions have reactions, and then so forth from there. Yeah? Okay. Yep. Okay.